like school chair. You had to interrogate me. We wouldn't, I wouldn't dare. Um, th thank you, Karen. Can I just have a show of hands? Who's here for the first time? Quite a lot. Why? <laughs> You've missed quite a lot of people, but don't worry, we've got more to come. We've got Tessa Jo on Monday, next week, Michael King on Tuesday, and then I know Barry Humphreys is coming, and then we're doing special events like the Battle of the Noodles. So AA Gill is going to come. Well, AA is going to come with a lot of tell you to talk about pasta. I'm going to bring Ken Hong to talk about noodles. <laughs> and we're going to tell the Italians that it was we who invented the stuff, and they're going to tell us that it was Marco Polo who never went to China as far as I'm concerned, and uh, we're going to have a battle of, of uh, history. With. So we've got very exciting things coming, and uh, please look up our website because we update our exciting program all the time. Today, I'm particularly pleased, uh, Sherry Blair is here. Uh, the format is very simple. I have a conversation with her, and uh, she talks about anything she wants in addition and she doesn't have to say anything that she doesn't want. And it applies to the questions and answers. Um, I'm going to give you half an hour, at least half an hour, so that you, the general audience, can interact with our speaker. That's the sine qua non of this forum. Uh, but it is an intele intellectual and intelligent forum, so no stupid questions, okay? And uh, if they're not intelligent or inappropriate, they will be passed over and, um, and um, that's that. Uh, okay, now, um, we're going to talk about a lot about the power of women. What do you think about the fact that in this country, uh, new prime minister is a woman, home secretary is a woman, minister of agriculture is a woman, it seems to be overrun by women. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Clinton seems to be heading for a, 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 a presidency. Um, there's a German chancellor who's been there for a long time. She's a woman. Uh, are women overtaking the world? I wish they did. I really do. And, and the fact that you think that just because there are now eight women in cabinet, members of cabinet of 23, that women are taking over, uh, I think only shows that you're not very good at maths. <laughs> so, but, but, but more than ever before. More than ever before, uh, certainly more than David Cameron's cabinet, because that was seven. Um, I know Tony was very proud when he was prime minister, he was the first prime minister to have a third of his cabinet as women. That's, so, a, that's a third of our grenade as seven, so there's fewer than eight. <laughs> well, there's 23 at the moment, so your question about 8 out of 23 or, or 7 out of 24, I'm not sure, it depends how you calculate. Or I think I would 7 say, and a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that whatever it was, it was the first time anyway that we started to see women holding these offices of state. First, actually, a woman home secretary was actually uh, also but that's not the point I really want to make. I think it's absolutely fantastic that we've got a woman prime minister. Um, I think it's great that we've got more women in, in power. I'm particularly pleased uh, to see Angela Lenson in the, the Ministry of Agriculture because I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation that she's going to have with the farmers. And we can all enjoy that <laughs> as, as we go along. Do you think the farmers will be better off with or without subsidies? Or with internal subsidies rather than European subsidies? I don't think they're going to get that many internal subsidies, but I would certainly say that since I am not a farmer, I think you're probably better off asking a real farmer what, whether they think they'll be better off or not. But, but going back to this question about women, it looks great, doesn't it? We may have a female president of the United States. Angela Merkel has been an extremely successful <laughs> German chancellor. Um, Mrs. May has absolutely made an impact instantly. I mean, let, let, let's face it, we know there's been a, a change as a, as a result of this. But when you actually look at the reality across the world, and if you look at, for example, the World Economic Forum, and it, since 2006, I know because I, was, uh, I launched the first report they did, they've produced a global gender gap, and they've looked across the OECD countries to see what the uh, parity is between men and women in various areas, and four areas they do are health, education, political engagement, and economic empowerment. And the good news is that 
that when it comes to health and education, the, the parity between men and women in the different countries has almost reached 100%. In both cases, it's 93, 94%. Uh, this doesn't mean that everyone's getting great education, by the way. It's simply that it's about comparing the quality of education in that country that men get compared to the quality of education in that country that women get. Needless to say, in our country, as you'd expect, we, we score up the full marks on that one, as do most of the European countries. But if you look at where the real power in the world lies, and that, of course, is in political engagement and the economic activity, well, it's a different story. As far as economic women's participation on an equal basis in the economy, the figure is over 60%, so six women to every 10 men. And if you look at political power, the figure still today is 23%. That's two women, essentially, for every 10 men parliamentarians, 10 men politicians in the world. So I think, much as I would love to say that the 21st century uh, is now, and I certainly hope I will be able to say in the future that it will be the time when women have equal access to power in the world. I'm afraid, David, that um, we haven't made it yet. And I can also that's say that Britain's going to do exactly. better now in this report because at the moment we're 18th in that global gender gap report and we'll get lots of credit actually for having a female prime minister. That will definitely see us go up the, the ratings in the next report of correct equal. All right, I've okay. heard it all before now. <laughs> <laughs> the point is this, let's so go... men are not very obedient. Let's go to the core argument. Right. Let me accept that it is a good thing for there to be more women and there should be a greater balance of gender. So the assumption must be that women bring something different to what men bring. Other than the fact that they more or less wear skirts rather than trousers, um, what else does a woman bring to a quorum that a man does not? So what is the basic additional uh, advantage that a woman might be able to bring to the table? Uh, well, let, 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 let me, um, first of all, make the obvious point is that we're going to have to talk in generalities here. Because actually, women are as different from each other as men are as different from each other. But having said that, you can make some general statements which are based on uh, what we have observed from, from, from the world around. And I think the key actual difference between men and women, and I, I can tell you some of the characteristics later, but I think it comes out of a different kind of experience. And the point is, a woman from birth to death has different kinds of experiences in the world than men. And so actually, since that's 50% of the population, if we're talking about having a proper rounded view of the world, we need to be able to have those experiences reflected in every area of life. We have this discussion in the law, for example. You know, is a woman judge better than a man judge? No. Uh, are, they, um, are they likely to come to the same view if there is such a thing as a right view about a technical point on a contract? Uh, probably they'll come to the same view. But in certain issues, particularly uh, issues that have an impact on social policy, they will have different experiences of the world, and we've seen that in cases, so we, we've seen women take different views about uh, things like rape, about things like um, uh, sexual harassment. Why? Because actually they have experienced that and know a little bit more about what it's like. Now, that doesn't just apply to men and women, of course it also applies to uh, uh, race, sexual orientation, age even, what we need in our world is diversity. What we don't need in our world is groupthink and everyone uh, behaving the same. Now, having said that, you will hear, you probably have read, that people say women generally, their management style is more consensual. Um, uh, we see that women generally seem to be more keen to keep the peace. Um, We've all, we've all probably heard them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, except when it comes to their husbands, but of course they wow. just want to keep them in their place. Yeah, where it matters. <laughs> but but you, um, and you, you've probably also heard that 
the, the, the joke that maybe if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters, we wouldn't have got into that terrible mess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, there is something about this because there is whether 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 it's something to do with the microbiome or whether it's just the way as society we have uh, educated our, our boys and girls. Um, you know, we do seem to encourage perhaps more reckless behaviour in, 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 in men, which is seen as, uh, and what is seen as, um, perhaps, for example, uh, leadership qualities and assertiveness in men is seen as bossiness and, and a general sort of lack of femininity in women. We have all sorts of, of, of assumptions uh, that we make, but the, all the research shows that if you actually have mixed groups, it's actually not a good idea, by the way, it would be a bad idea to have a cabinet of 23 women, just as it's actually a bad idea to have a cabinet of 23 men. But do remember that right up until, and including Mrs. Thatcher, who exclude the Prime Minister from the cabinet, that is what we had in our country, right up uh, to uh, John Major becoming Prime Minister, because he's the first one who appointed a woman to the cabinet, apart from obviously Margaret Thatcher being Prime Minister and in the cabinet. Diversity is, is what everything, every research shows that diverse groups are really important, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's in politics, um, or, or whether it's in, 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 in a company. I know, but I mean, let's say your husband's cabinet, eventually, he lost the, the, he lost the election, so that cabinet couldn't have performed that well, eventually, everybody loses. No, in fact, well, in politics, I think that's, uh, that, isn't that what they say, that, you know, it, and of course, the point about politics is, when I talk about diversity, it comes a point when actually I wouldn't advocate, much as I didn't like it, by the way, but I wouldn't advocate it that we would live under a one-party state and so that the Labour Party should have stayed in forever. And that is about diversity as well. It's about diversity of ideas. In the end, you know, you do have to shake things up. You do have to have change. Uh, so I don't think that the fact that uh, um, Tony Provided you didn't actually ever lose an election, but the fact that Gordon Brown lost the election <laughs> <laughs> has got anything whatsoever to do with the lack of women in his cabinet, because under Gordon Brown, the number of women did go down. Like well, yeah, you use the word diversity, diversity. It just reminds me that, in my humble opinion, the real difference between a man and a woman is that um, uh, women want security and men want diversity. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, but, 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 but it's, it's very interesting because I, um, I have this women's foundation. So I, I, my women's foundation is encouraging women's entrepreneurship in the developing world because we think it's tough here for us to, 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 to progress. It's definitely tougher in many parts of the world and I totally believe that women can only make choices if they have control of their own money. But one of the interesting things about that is that when we go along, and, and we do, we pitch for money, we, we, and one of the things, statistics we always point to is the interesting study that we've seen from various people, World Bank included, which is that if you give a development dollar to a woman, she will spend 90%, 90 cents of that, she will spend on others, her family, her community, back into the business. Now, if you give that development dollar to a man, um, how many, what, what do you think, David? Let me ask you. What, how much of that development dollar does the man spend on others? Well, it depends whether you're fit of green or not. No. <laughs> tell, me, tell me what you think the percentage is. I don't know. I mean, I guess perhaps 50%. Yeah. You see, you're too generous. The figure actually is 30 to 40%. Um, and that's because uh, I, mean, I told this story to a group of women I met in Kenya that we were helping their uh, agricultural workers up on the, the border in North. Kenya and we were helping them develop business skills in their, in their farming and uh, they were all sitting together in a group and I said to them, you know, this is, this is the, re the reason we're coming here and we're helping you is because it shows that if we give money to women they spend it more wisely and I said that the figure was 90% and I said to them, what do you think the figure is for men? And you know what they said? 10%. <laughs> and, and, and I said to the man who was with me, because I was there and they had some uh, government person coming with me to show me around and everything, I turned to him and I said, but you're a man, why are you not ashamed to hear that men you know, are regarded like this? 
uh, by these women. He said, no, they're absolutely right. If you give the money to the men, they'll spend it on drink, or they'll spend it on gambling, or they'll spend it on, on women. I um, know, so, I, if, so I think women are, tend to be more conscientious. And why are they more conscientious? Because they're left literally often holding the baby. And therefore, they have to be conscientious. And so many of those women that I met, you know, had been left really I mean, as the sole support for that for well, their families, I mean, and they you, worked out. Sherry, uh, listen to you. I mean, sometimes or often, we men are accused of being sexist. I mean, you have just said something which is a sort of sexist in favour of women. Uh, isn't that right? I mean, is, it, is that acceptable? In this well, I, th I think, David, that the question is whether it's true or not. And the reality well, is... I don't know, but uh, uh, I, 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 I'm only taking your word about the stupid survey. I, I, don't, know I, don't, I, don't, I don't think truth is, is, is sexist or not sexist. Truth is truth. And I don't necessarily blame the men. And by the way, in my foundation, we very much uh, it want men to participate. And um, we do, in fact, we have a global mentoring platform where we mentor women entrepreneurs around the world. And we ask people to give two hours um, uh, a month over the internet to support a woman entrepreneur. And in that program, 20% of our mentors are men. And I'd love to see more men doing it. Why? Because so many of the women we work with don't know what a supportive man looks like. Because all they have seen in their lives is men telling them what they can't do, not what they can do. And a lot of that, of course, is to do with societal judgment, and we can change that. I believe we are seeing that change. I feel my own... How do, you change Saudi, how do you change Saudi Arabia? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult... How do you even but begin to change a country like Saudi Arabia? But, but remember, actually, firstly, the late king had started doing that. He'd set up five cities around where they were, he was going to encourage men and women to come together. The new king and the new uh, defence minister, who is the Deputy Crown Prince, or uh, I think that's the correct title, but the number three, uh, are also doing a lot more to encourage, in, in their fashion, women to uh, take part more in the economy. But you do have societal structures, you do have customs that mean that it's much more difficult to do that. And so what we want to do is to advocate and support change. And interestingly, we have found that if we can help women help themselves, that uh, partly, I think, because it does then tend to improve the, the lot of their entire family, including the male members of their family, we find that most men, if it comes to it, and their life is getting better because their wife is, 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 is having a business and running a business, most men actually go along with that. So, for example, I was in um, South Africa just last week, or was it two weeks ago? I was, Track, I think two weeks ago, to launch uh, our mentoring report, which was, a, was, which was a study that we did by an independent uh, expert on mentoring about where this idea, can you really mentor someone not face to face but over the internet? Does it make any difference? And when I, when I was there, we also visited four of our mentors. Um, one of those mentors was a woman who had been working for some time in the stationery business. This was a business that provided stationary supplies to companies. And she told me she sort of resigned about three times the way she was treated, but she'd always been persuaded to go back because actually she was the backbone of that business. Her boss decided to retire and offered her the opportunity to buy that business. Um, and she, she, you know, she wasn't sure about it, so obviously she asked her husband. Her husband says, are you mad? You're going to take out a loan of over a million rand in order to, to pay this back. In two years, we'll be bankrupt and the, and the business will have gone down the tube or whatever the South African equivalent is. But she did get a loan and she did start that business. And eight years on, she's expanded into two companies and her husband is now part of the business and working for her. So that's a real example of how when men see what works, they're perfectly happy to participate. Then another mentee, again, that we just saw at that time, um, was, a, was a young woman, well, most women seem young to me now, I'm really old, but she, um, she was in her 30s and she had been um, 
trade that she'd been doing a correspondence course in university when her parents decided she was to get married. They were in quite a religious South African family, and so she was married to um, an older man within that religious community. And her father and her husband decided that actually, now she was married, she really didn't need a university degree, and therefore that was the end of that. So she, she was married. Four years on, she has a little boy. Thirteen years on, she discovers that her husband has been a serial womanizer throughout that whole time, despite his status in the church. <laughs> and uh, she decides that she cannot put up with that and uh, decides to leave him. Uh, two, two things happen. One is her parents disown her because they say, you know, you've married for better or worse than you must stay. And, 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 uh, and the, the second thing is she starts her own business. Uh, and she does the only thing she knows what to do. She has a cake and a catering business. And she has managed, thanks to the help of a mentor, to actually make that business work so she can support herself and her son. Now, when we went to see her on that day, she'd been up with only really her and some, uh, a friend that sometimes helps her. I know, but she, I'm she, she was, that. Yes, but these, so, so please don't, because uh, the, the point about it again is this attitude that men sometimes have towards women and what they can and cannot do. Because their family and her husband didn't think she'd make a go of it, but she has made a go of it, and she has stuck. Well, I'm, I'm sure that Henry brought examples, but I'm sure that there are counter examples the other way. Which, oh, uh, what? The women not being able to manage? Oh, well, I mean, we, we men are. I mean, you are. The, so hen -hen, the word hen -hen is, is universal. Yeah, the <laughs> Half the time, we, we are, the, we are the, the underdog in any family. I mean, you go and ask any family who, who wears a sock. It's always a white man. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> the only difference is that we, we let you think you wear the socks, uh, and that's you don't. But, but no, we are more cunning than you, more intelligent. That is totally true because time and time again, when <clears throat> men argue that they don't want things changed for women, they will always trot out this line oh, but really, she's the power behind the throne, she's the one that wears the trousers, little me, poor man, I'm just the one that has to go out and do all the hard work outside and get all the glory. Actually, that's just a, 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 a smokescreen to hide the fact that uh, men are not being willing to share power equally with women. And it, it, that, that's just a kind of getting What sort of argument you have with Tony? Yeah. Uh, when, when because Tony never together. disagrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> That, you're going to be many. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. I, I, I tried to get him for dinner the other night. I said there were two, oh. two supermodels, and immediately you slapped him down and said, You're not going. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I, I'm not allowed to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. And this only happened two weeks ago. Now, um, how about transgender? Are you going to, uh, are they going to figure in, 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 uh, in our future life? Well, they already do, I think. And again, just again, it goes back to diversity, doesn't it? And about people actually being whatever it is they can be without any restrictions on that um, so that they can fulfill their own potential. Um, so, uh, and I go back to what I say, we given that 50% of the population are women. The fact that all the research, we all know that across the world, women, there's nowhere across the world where women have achieved equal standing and equal status to men. And yet, actually, if we just come together with equal respect and equal dignity, we can do so much more together than we can do apart. So I'm not a person who thinks, after all, I've got three sons and only one daughter, that you know, we don't want them, we want a world without men. We absolutely want a world with men who equally are able to show their caring side, because I think it's, it's equally a stereotype to say that men don't care for their children or men, you know, are not homemakers, as it is to say that women can't be CEOs of companies. People have different talents and different skills, and it's when we come together because of those differences that things get exciting. Well, what do you say about a country like China, where 60% are men and 40% are women because of the one-child policy? So now you're going to be about 100 million men who, are, uh, who will have no women to go with. Uh, so either they have to become homosexual or they have to resign <laughs> to the fact that they have to go or whatever. So, 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 so <laughs> what do you men do? I mean, here's a situation where 
there is a lack of womanhood uh, amongst the nation. Um, and but we have to ask ourselves, why is it that, because uh, it seems to, scientifically that in a sort of natural birth rate, you'll probably get about 103 girl babies to 100 men, but boy babies. Uh, but in fact, in places like India and in places like China, it's more like 80 girls to 100 men. Now, that did not happen by nature or by accident. It did happen, as you said, because of deliberate choices either to abort female babies or um, to uh, kill them shortly after birth by abandoning them or in, sometimes, you know, mothers just roll over and smother the child in, in, in the bed. And that's because society was not valuing these girl children in the same way as the boy children. And yet, of course, the society and the culture was wrong because, as you rightly point out, there are big problems in these societies now because there isn't a rough equality of men and women. And so there are a lot of angry young men who feel that they can't, uh, they can't actually have a family life and settle down. And, and it also seems, uh, and we see this with young offenders too, that it often is the civilizing effect of being married, having children, that, that, that calms men down and enables them to make the contribution they can to progressive society, when sometimes as young, um, younger men, maybe that testosterone, I was gonna say it rushes to the head, but it's probably not the head where it rushes to the head. Let me ask you one more general question before I, I let the audience have a go. Um, why is it that I have never heard of any Successful or brilliant female composer. Oh, David. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but you can name one thing. I mean, there are, in literature, there are a few writers. A few writers? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and they all wrote under pseudonyms, so in yes, fact, it proves that they, they, they work better when, they, when they're under pressure. So it was a good thing that they were suppressed. Yeah, but in music, we how can you explain what we, happened in well, music? Yes, well, a number of things happened. Firstly, we don't know how many women that there the were in years gone by with great talent who never had the opportunity to put that talent to the test because they were not educated. Even if they were educated, they weren't allowed to go out and, and yeah, but it happened develop in literature. their skills. But it happened in literature. Oh, but remember, the thing about literature, uh, and of course, we all know that Courier Ellis Bell were not calling themselves that because they fancy being men, but because they didn't think anyone would buy a book by a woman. Um, and the Brontes, by the way. <laughs> um, but, and George Eliot. And George Eliot, of course. But, um, you know, writing a book, you can do from your desk in the home. So it is one way of expressing yourself without actually Sorry, having to Sorry, composers do that at home. Mr. Well, Linsky wrote, writing straight and sitting on a table in a stupid flat the other day that Beethoven, I saw. Beethoven was dead at one time, but actually, you know, to actually, if you really want to write a, a, a piece for an orchestra, you really need to be able to go out and engage with an orchestra. And that does involve going, even if you're writing it here, you do actually have to perform it and know about engaging it in performance outside of the world. Even so in I don't art. accept that that's even in and art. And even, even in mm -hmm. art. For, for example, the, 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 the Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, women weren't allowed to go out to the painting in those. Nobody in the Renaissance. I mean, no, but, but, no but we, don't, we don't know if there were women who were very talented at art there. In fact, but because they weren't allowed to go out and work, how do we know? We just don't know. For all we know, there could have been a Michelangelo. <laughs> it was actually totally fantastic, but actually was never allowed to pick up a paintbrush and was kept indoors having babies. <laughs> all right, uh, let, let's, as you've come all this way, let, let's, uh, your question, you, you, yeah. all right, um, you, you decide. Yeah, you, you decide, don't look at me, just. <laughs> uh, good evening. Um, what advice would you give the Camerons as they prepare to leave down the street? I definitely would advise them to take a holiday. <laughs> and um, obviously, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very poignant moment. Uh, and of course, we've been through it ourselves. And to, to see little Florence, who was born in Cape Downing Street, early home, she knew Leo, my son, was born in Downing Street, 
was the only home he knew. And we sometimes, you know, people forget that politicians really are human beings, and, and that, they, that they are people who genuinely yeah, but, but with respect, if you left on a, on a high, I wouldn't say that the Camerons are leaving on a high. But on a personal level still, they're, they're, they're a family, and, and they've had two days to get out of their home. I mean, you know, I, I think as a human being, you absolutely must, must feel sympathy for that. And you know, uh, I certainly do, and I've always found David and Samantha really nice people. And, um, where should they go on holiday? Um, <laughs> wherever, the, wherever they actually want you, because we all know that the Prime Minister's choice of holiday becomes a political hot potato, because we won't even allow the whole plans for the Prime Minister to take a holiday. If you were Samantha today, where would you suggest they would go? <laughs> Cornwall, Bucklands, uh, <laughs> or uh, Hadi High, or the south of France, or... Rio de Janeiro. It depends what they want, they're, what they're, but somewhere where they can be quiet and private and, and spend some real quality family time. And that's whatever place suits them as a family. All right. Hi, it's so nice to hear you speak. Thank you. Um, my question was you had such a long career and it's been amazing. You've done so many different things. I just, I've had a very short one, obviously, but I'm wondering how you stay motivated to keep doing these things for people. You must have had so much backlash at times, you know, just why are you doing that? And how do you wake up in the morning and not think, this is not worth it, you know, just, I'll go to my private holiday somewhere. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, I think I've always been a, a, a driven person. When I was 14, I told all the girls in my grammar school that I was going to be the first woman prime minister of the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, effectively did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wish my husband was quite that much. Um, but um, I've also been an optimist. I think, you know, you either believe the glass is half full or half empty, and I've always believed it's, it's half full. Um, I was very influenced by my mother and my grandmother, both strong women, uh, I think talented women, but both of whom, for various reasons, my grandma, because in, uh, in her day, girls left school at 14 anyway, and my mother, because her own mother died when she was 14, and she had to give up school in order to look after her father, who was a coal miner, and her 10-year-old brother. And, uh, you know, they were always very motivated for my sister and I to do um, whatever it was uh, that we wanted to do and that we could do to the best of our ability. And so my mother just died a month ago, so it's very, she's very much on my mind. And I think she would be horrified if I just sort of said, oh, I'm going to give up now. This is not the time to give up. I think, and some I can see some people in the room, uh, 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 as you get to a stage when your children grow up, I feel as a woman you can speak out more. You've got a lot more freedom, and this is a real opportunity to do even more, to speak up on behalf of sometimes of, of younger women or women in other parts of the world who don't have that freedom and, and uh, aren't listened to in quite the same way. This is actually even more of a time to be doing things than that. Yes. Um, oh, uh, so you were, you were an exceptionally talented barrister and you've had a very distinguished legal career. Uh, so hypothetically, say there was a former world leader who was facing potential legal action over their decision to go to war, what advice would you give them? Uh, I would give them uh, the advice that anyone who does the, the right thing and um, does it out of good motives is going to be fine. Yes, of course. Yeah, and then the fact that, yeah, this one and I'm a football agent. Um, that's fantastic. Well, that's, that, that's a woman in a man's world, too, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I wanted to find out what is it like, life after number 10? Well, I think for me, actually, um, it was, you know, I have no idea what an amazing privilege it was to be in number 10 and to have um, an insight into, you know, one of the most famous places in the world of what was going on and to, to see the changes that were made in those 10 years. But on the other hand, it was also a bit of a constraint upon me because I, I, um, I can always remember... Uh, the election was on the 1st of May, it was a bank holiday weekend. On the Tuesday, I was um, due in court, in the Court of Appeal, doing a case about employment rights, about the transfer of undertaking 
protection of employment regulations. You can see how interesting that really was. <laughs> it's actually very important, but it's a technical legal point. I turned up in court, and there in the, in, in the, the public gallery were all these reporters, all sitting there. You know, they lasted about five minutes because, frankly, the, the, the case wasn't interesting enough for them. But, you know, you suddenly realized that you're, you're right, you know, I, I, I'm Queen's Council, which means that I'm pretty good at my job. There's plenty of other Queen's Council too, and they're also very good at their job. You know, my job is a, a job that you're only as good as your last case in. Um, you know, suddenly there was this added dimension. I used to do work for the government when there was a Tory government, and it was a Tory Lord Chancellor who made me for Queen's Council. As soon as my husband became Prime Minister, I couldn't possibly do a case for the government because people would say oh, it was some kind of favoritism. So it, that affected uh, the sort of things I could do. On the other hand, I also had this amazing opportunity to be able to go around the world to meet people. You know, for, for me, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, so you know, to, to meet Pope John Paul and after him Pope Benedict, to go to Pope, Pope John Paul's funeral, you know, to be friendly with two presidents in the United States, you know, French president, to have, to, have, to, have Stevie, to have Stevie want to sing Masha Mia more for me in the White House. I mean, you know, this was pretty nice. You know? <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I had to be very careful. I mean, I do have views, and suddenly I'm not allowed to have views. Uh, and I, but your husband was one afterwards. So you, after now, <laughs> you now, you now, now regret not being able to ring up the president, <laughs> ring up Stevie Wonder. He, he was in the park the other night. <laughs> if, if, if you were passing the party, you, you would have been able to ring him up if you were, if Tony was still prime minister, and said, hey, Stevie, can you ring, sing me this song? Do you, do, you, do you miss all that? That's your point. Isn't it? My, that's, actually, my point wasn't that I miss all that. My point is that now I can actually, I can stand out and say some things like, you know, there should be more women in the cabinet without people thinking that this is government policy. That is a great freedom. I can go and do this work that we do to help women entrepreneurs, to help them uh, get the business training they need, to help support them with the business networks, to help them use mobile technology to build on and, and grow their businesses and to help them get the money that they need to grow their businesses without being worried that somehow or other people are going to think there's some kind of you know, political or governmental agenda behind that. So in a sense, um, free. I'm freer. And also, you know, yeah, I've got my own home and I can choose my own furniture. <laughs> 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 yes, I, I, I was telling my son yesterday that I think when I was watching the changeover and so on, and it's quite dramatic, isn't it, when it happens? <coughs> and I was uh, telling my son that I thought that seeing you and your husband walk into Downing Street and standing there and, and, and everyone waiting for it to happen was one of the most exciting moments and hopeful moments of my growing up. Um, and I hope that he sees something equally optimistic that I'm not sure which decade he'll wait for it. Um, and there was some point when, when, it, when everyone was moaning about something or else your husband was doing, and I said, I said to my grandmother, I said, you know, I think the late governments do make a difference, you know, whatever people like to say. And she said, oh yes, Mr. Ackley, he meant that we could actually, didn't, we could actually go on working after we got married and what a big difference that it made to her. And many, um, certainly very gay friends I have, say that, that your husband's administration made an enormous difference to their lives, and it would be unthinkable that we now have gay cabinet ministers um, without that. And yet, when, I, when I'm looking after my son at home, um, while his mum's working, um, I still switch on the telly, or he switches on the telly, and I see um, still incredible stereotypes in the media, and women who have to move on very promptly as soon as they get a bit too old and they're told that it's time for them to look elsewhere. And it still seems to me that parts of the world are, as you say, seem to, on the one hand it seems to change, can change enormously, and yet it, the other areas of it can still look very much the same. And I, and, and I wonder what your thoughts are about the media image that comes across to our young people. Well, well, thank you for the kind things you said about uh, the optimistic 1997, and I do like to think that you know there were many changes in Britain which we still have the effect of today, and which uh, which we can be very very proud of. And congratulations to you too for being a stay-at-home dad, as I assume 
you're, that's what you're saying, because it goes back to what I was saying. There are plenty of men who also want to care. And, you know, the family should be able to make the right decisions for them about uh, how they arrange their affairs. So that is uh, that is really good. And one of the things I think that is damaging sometimes, you know, I do think it's damaging, is the stereotypes that our media still um, perpetrate. And you mentioned the TV in particular, and we've seen, we've actually seen legal cases about that. And uh, as a lawyer, I, I'm very happy that we do have laws that at least try and make that a little less um, difficult to, 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 to impose. But there, there definitely are double standards. We see it too, don't we, in, in the politicians again. You know, there's endless talk about what women are wearing in our politics. I mean, Theresa May, our now prime minister, you know, she had to, there was some low cut dress she had on that, you know, really, that's what, that's what the press thought was important to, to talk about. It wasn't that low cut. Well, just she does have quite I mean, she always <laughs> shows. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, whatever, every single picture I've seen her, she is always showing a short cleavage. But is that so awkward? No, no, I think it's very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you this, do you think the world, do you think Britain is better off with or without the Daily Mail? I think this world would be a lot better off without the Daily Mail. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Mrs. Blair. Get on with it. Yeah, I know. But, um, <laughs> we have no time. Get on with it. Okay. Well, what's your perception on um, uh, much more elaboration on uh, Theresa May as the new Prime Minister? Well, I, I, I of course, have met Theresa May on a number of occasions. And uh, when, when Tony was in government, she was the Tory, the Tory woman's spokesman. So often we, I went to a lot of uh, functions, but spoke at conferences, she would speak as well, and I have no doubt whatsoever her commitment to ensuring um, equal treatment and equal uh, value for, for men and women. I think um, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's perhaps she may well have wanted to have more than eight women in her cabinet, but I think it's a real statement of intent that she uh, does believe in an e e equal uh, Why did she not uh, come up to say anything? at all about immigration, which was the key issue in the, in the, from Brexit um, when she was a remainder. And she kept very silent. Um, I well, heard that she was busy on manoeuvres. So do you think she was she's incredibly cunning uh, uh, over this whole thing? Well, I, I think it's too soon. I hardly claim to be an intimate of, of, of Theresa May. I simply say that what, from what I've seen in, person, in relation to women's issues, she has been very consistent on this, and uh, she seems to be continuing with, with that as, as Prime Minister. We wait, wait to see what sort of Prime Minister she's going to be, but the one thing is quite interesting, isn't it, is that she appears to have given us far more surprises today than people anticipated. So maybe the Theresa May we've been told about in the papers, slightly dull, safe pair, pair of hands, is just a projection from the many male politicians who were dismissing her before she became Prime Minister, who are now having to recalibrate cali their views of her. But we don't know yet. The, the thing about being Prime Minister is there are many, many decisions, so many decisions. It's a really hard job. And how she deals with that, um, we'll, we will see over time. Uh, evening. Uh, as we're comparing men and women, uh, particularly from the executive presence aspect, the gravitas communication and the leadership presence comes up. How do you compare the best of the female leaders we have? have Teresa and Angela and um, Hillary Clinton, uh, maybe the next president, uh, with Obama's and Clinton's and David Cameron and Tony Blair's. So in terms of executive presence, if the women are taking over the world as, as, as we just warned, so how would it look like uh, in terms of executive presence when you're comparing male, males and females? Well, I think it, you know, the, it all depends on a person's character. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, as we know, Bill Clinton was different from George Bush, and I'm sure that Theresa May is going to be different from Angela Merkel or Hillary Clinton, too. I think that, um, uh, you know, it's it's difficult to say when when you come to world leaders, if, uh, you know, just uh, I said before, didn't I, that men and women we can speak in generalities, but in the end, uh, people are all individual and. Holding these sort of posts, it is absolutely about the individual. 
Um, and so um, we've seen, I suppose, people say that Angela Merkel is, is cautious. So that's what they've been trying to say, that Theresa May is also cautious. But maybe Theresa May is not going to be so cautious. Um, uh, we will, we will, I, I really don't think you can, you can really speculate at this point. I mean, I remember when I was a, a law student, and at that time we had a the first book that all the law students were given was a book called Learning the Law by Professor Glanville, Glanville Williams of Cambridge University. And he, in his book, said that, well, okay, women can be lawyers, but really, women should not be barristers. Because you know, women really are no good as advocates. Because he said a woman's voice is shrill and greedy and doesn't travel as far as a man. <laughs> now, clearly, I obviously thought he was talking about somebody else. <laughs> and I also think Mrs. Gladden Williams was obviously a very, very tolerant woman. Her voice was never heard by her husband. But, you know, that, that's just a... That was just a stereotype, and you know the fact is, um, women's voices are different from men's, but that doesn't mean that they're any uh, less good. Uh, they're, they're, they're just different. As a Catholic, do you think the Pope should ever be a, a should ever be a woman Pope? Do you know I um, I would like to see. I think it's, it's a bit like the Saudi Arabia question. You know, uh, the idea that tomorrow we're going to see. Uh, women priests, that love women bishops and a women pope is, you know, pie in the sky, isn't it? But what I would like to see in the Catholic Church is a lot more posts that don't have to be governed by being uh, ordained priest. Uh, being well, there were women, women, women priests, the popes in the, in the Yes, in the I know, but she was disguised as a man, wasn't she? Well, she was a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, but so I think, I think that, you know, we need to hear more of women's voices. I don't think, for example, that... You know, we need, when, when we have talk about, about family and, and 21st century life, that necessarily the greatest authority in this is a celibate over 60 year old bishop. And that we need to hear more young voices, we need to hear more women's voices, uh, and that the, the church too needs to be reformed. And I don't think, uh, I think Pope Francis is in his own way trying to do that. But I mean, look, look at that. I mean, it is like Saudi Arabia, and it's completely. No, I don't think. Okay. Well, I don't think Catholic Church in Saudi Arabia is a, is a really fair. Well, in terms comparison. of women on trade, I mean, it's really, I mean, it's, it's very prejudiced. Yes. Yeah, whoever has the mic, go on, quick. I wondered what you um, looked for in a Hillary Clinton presidency. Would you, for example, do anything about the government? Well, I'm sure that she absolutely would want to. The question is whether, in fact, she can, because I'm absolutely no doubt. I mean, President Obama's already told us that he would want to, too, but the, 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 the checks and balances in the American system actually mean that it isn't a dictatorship. And at the moment, the way uh, Congress is set up and the way Congress is funded and the national right NRA being such a powerful body and so many people, um, beholden to them, it's very difficult to see uh, that you know you can just suddenly come in and change everything overnight. But would she want to? I'm sure. Are there things that you can do? Yes, probably, but I suspect that President Obama has already explored so many of those. So she's not going to be able to do that unless at the same time as the elected president changes, there's a change in, in, in Congress uh, and, and in, in the Senate. So it's all about whether, it's not just about who becomes president in America, it's also about all those other races that are going on to see whether they, these things will change. But one thing we know about Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, for example, is that she really did push the woman's agenda. She really did carry out the, the, the promise that she showed way back in Beijing in the, in the Women's Summit there when she said women's rights are human's rights. And she put, she put her, money where her mouth was, we put in programs that the State Department did, she appointed the first global ambassador for, for women, and she also uh, raised these issues with some of these difficult, difficult regimes. So I'm sure that she would continue to do that if, as I hope she does, she becomes president. But that's up to the American people. I don't think she would become president. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's going to be Donald Trump? Yes. 
And do you think that's going to be a good thing? I think it'll be marvelous. It will absolutely um, irritate the whole of America. <laughs> you know, actually, it's funny, really, because I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, so, I'm supposed to be the socialist, but I actually think that the best change is, is gradual, organic change. He is supposed to be the, 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 the more conservative one, and he's the one who wants no, 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 we like the revolution as opportunities. We, we like risk. We like, we like the uncertainty. I think you need to balance your risk taking with my caution, don't you? <laughs> Hi, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming and sharing your ideas. Um, my question is going back to something you said at the beginning, and you mentioned about mentoring. Um, I wonder what your thoughts were about, as well as getting men to mentor women, also getting them to champion women, and a different approach, which is slightly more than just, this is how I did it, please do it the same. No, you're absolutely right. You, you. Uh, you probably, I'm sure you all obviously do know, that there's a question about mentorship and there's a question about sponsorship as well. And uh, often, in, in, particularly within companies and within careers, uh, sponsorship is, is, is more important. Mentoring, if you like, is, is helping and advice. But sponsorship is actually doing concrete things to put people in positions where they can um, grow. I was very lucky, um, there's a tradition in, in the bar that more senior barristers look after their pupils and they look after the people that works with them and helps promote them to other um, uh, other clients. Uh, and I, I, was, I was lucky that I had some good men who did sponsor me in, in that way and brought me into cases and recommended me to their, their solicitors. Our program for mentoring, however, is slightly different than that because I think that's more about within, when you're within a, an organization, our mentoring uh, program is, is of course about helping women across the world, women who perhaps are the only <coughs> ones in their community doing that sort of thing, who are, are trailblazers and are looking for practical help and advice which they can't find within their, their own communities. And for that of course sponsorship isn't really the, the same thing, it is much more, some of our women have described the, uh, their mentor as their invisible friend who walks with them on their journey and talking to them about what a difference that makes to them, to know that there's someone there who, when going gets rough, cares about them and is actually willing to try and help them sort out their problems. It's a very powerful thing. And we found from the mentors as well, that they find it incredibly inspiring. And they feel very proud of how they've been able to help a woman over a year. That's the mess, they're, they're the words that we hear all the time. So this report we did showed that 93% of the mentors uh, felt that they had grown and changed themselves being a mentor, that they had learned new things about themselves and started to think uh, in a more imaginative way, trying to help women solve uh, problems which possibly in their big companies or in, in, in a place here where you know the electricity is going to come on when you press a switch, make a difference. And our women, on the other hand, who were the mentees, 97% of those who were surveyed for the results um, had gained in confidence because the mentor and the help that they had. 92% of them had learned new skills, uh, whether it's about how to do a business plan, how to uh, finance, financial skills, questions about how you manage your employees. And 74% of them had actually increased their business opportunities and the money coming into their business as a result. So it's been a very interesting and powerful platform which just shows how the internet can bring us together across the world. We have ment mentors and mentees in 90 different countries, and we recruit at the moment in May and November, and so we're recruiting at the moment for November, men who are looking for mentors, and I'd love it if people would consider it. Uh, we will have another 800 women from across the world who we have identified with our local partners as being <coughs> suitable for this sort of mentorship. And if anyone would like to go onto the internet for two hours a month and have a real personal relationship and help someone um, improve their business, uh, improve their lives, um, we'd be really delighted if you could if you could look it up on the web. If you do Sheree Blair mentoring, you you will find it because 
uh, if it wasn't for our volunteers who help these women. But, but are these physically, can they be corrected? Because it seems to me that they, you are talking about successes all the time, and 92% yeah, I know it's I, don't, I, know, I, I know, it's almost too good to be true, isn't it? Well, that's why we got somebody independent to do it, and actually the report is also on our website, so you, you can read it too. So. Uh, we, we've been doing that mentoring platform now since about 2010. We started off with 30 mentors, men, 30, men, 30 mentors and 30 mentees. Uh, and now, as I say, we're, we're, we're actually pairing 800 uh, every six months. We've got ambitions to, to go even, even, even bigger than that. And so we asked somebody independent uh, to come and assess this and do a report. So what they did was they went back to 2010 and 2012, and at that, over that period we went to 350 women. And they went back to the women and they uh, looked at the, the materials, they spoke to them, and that's where they got these figures from. Well, those 74% 350 is an odd number. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 350 is not an odd number. Well, if you, if you get 74% of 350, you don't get a whole person. <laughs> well, David, I'm, I'm impressed with your work. And you're absolutely right, actually, it's 76%. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should look at my notes. You have about a third person somewhere. Go on. Um, thank you both for giving up your time today. Um, we've spoken quite a lot today about the empowerment of women, and I was wondering if you had any advice um, particularly for young women and those um, at the early stages of their career? Well, my main advice actually is to believe in yourself. And that's why one of the things we focus on is, is about confidence. Because even here, um, actually, often young women don't have as much confidence in themselves as, as, as young men. In fact, you know, sometimes, uh, again, research has shown that when you, um, women and men go for a job or a promotion, and say you have a 10, 10 criteria for this promotion here, have you got that? They find that women, unless they've got nine out of the 10, won't even bother to apply. Whereas men think, oh good, I've got six out of 10 of these, so obviously I'm the best candidate. And somehow or other, we need to do more to make women believe in themselves, because if you don't believe in yourself, then why should others believe in you? So it's really, be true to yourself, uh, and whatever it is your passion is, follow it. Whoever the mic. Okay. Who was a bit that? Thank you both for coming. Um, I want to go back to what you were talking about, the uh, ministerial split between men and women. I think that can be applied in business too. Um, my mother's employed, she works, she's quite successful, and she's employed a lot of people. But she employs down to personality type as opposed to trying to get an equal split. Do you think as we move forward through time, it becomes more acceptable, for example, a split cabinet, that that might lead to an area of positive discrimination, where you will over, say, employ a woman over a man, even though the man's a better fit, but you need the right statistics? I don't, I don't think you should ever employ somebody who's not up to the job in favour of another on the grounds of sex, and that's not um, something that, that's not, that, that is actually actual discrimination, not positive discrimination. However, it, it's very interesting that there's a discussion going on at the moment in, in the legal profession about the lack of women in the higher levels of the judiciary. Uh, because there we have 50% of the, the, the graduates at universities and law schools now being girls. As you go on through the profession, the, the women tend to drop out and the, the, the figures for female QCs are about 15%. Um, and we have only one woman on our Supreme Court and it's three or four now in, in, in the Court of Appeal. And as you know, you may, you may or may not know that we're about to lose, um, over the next few years, six of our most senior judges. And they've decided to take uh, those appointments in groups and, and appoint. And they have said that if both candidates are equal, and one is a man and one is a woman, then the woman will get the post. But they have, what they haven't said is if, if the woman is less equal than the man, she's going to get the post. So it, it's about making sure that you have a balance, because just like it's in companies, just like it's in politics, actually our senior judiciary need to reflect the world, and the world is made up of 50% women. Um, so um, uh, this is an issue, but we can't, you, you don't want to, you don't appoint people who are not qualified for the job, which goes to the next question, and David and I were talking about this in the car. It's also partly how you, 
define those characteristics. And you have to be really careful to make sure that the, the, the characteristics you're looking for for a job aren't actually um, themselves covered by assumptions about who does what sort of jobs. Um, and that, that's also very important too. So personality tests could be part of the, um, the answer to that, but we have to be conscious. Um, I know this myself because one of our mentees in India is actually a, an educational psychologist, and she's been designing um, tests for, for dyslexia and the children uh, in India. And she offers a service which is actually more Asian-centric because she realized that some of the sort of standard tests are actually more based on um, you know, European uh, standards. So, you know, in all these tests, you have, you, have, you have to be careful. I would never say that we should appoint someone just because they're a woman if they are not qualified, absolutely should qualified. Should the uh, condition of maternity leave uh, be a condition? What, what, what about I mean, You know, you're using your equal and so forth, but the, the woman is going to go and have three babies, so suddenly you'll find that, you know, for, 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 for nine months, three times uh, within the next ten years, she's going to be not working. Well, David, I, 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 I don't know many women who take uh, uh, um, well, not nine months, but all together. <laughs> uh, three months, I mean, whatever. And then you know, there's those days, and think, it's quite a lot of holiday. Not holiday, but leave. <laughs> <laughs> but leave they take. And, 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 and that's a fact of life. David, not, when, uh, when you and I go to have dinner later, we're going to have a very interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. Uh, yeah. Look, the, 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 this issue about maternity leave is an important issue, absolutely, but I like to think of it, we have to think about this as about parental leave. We have to start thinking about this, about what, as a country, how we, as a country, want to invest in our next generation. And therefore, we have to do as much as we can to ensure that women are able to have babies Absolutely, but are also able to carry on pursuing their careers. We have invested a lot of money in their education, in their training. They have so much to give. We cannot, in a career that is likely to span these days, because we're going to be working till 70, you know, what, 50 years perhaps, the idea that as part of that, there may be a period, a short period of time in 50 years, when those women may, because of biology, have to take maternity leave. We can't therefore say that this is a once and for all decision. And if you take that decision, you cannot then pursue your career. And I speak to someone who had four babies in the end and still um, uh, managed to maintain my career. Now that does not mean, by the way, that I didn't have to calibrate my career when I was having children. When I had three children under the age of five, um, you know, I think I had to, to some extent, go slightly slower on the down pedal of my career. Once, once my daughter had got into nursery school, I put that down pedal down again and uh, found myself five years later we're as a QC. But we, you know, we don't have to take decisions in our 20s or in our 30s. We have a member here, the audience who is pregnant. Do yeah. you feel uh, that you're handicapped in any way? And you're now, what, six months on? <laughs> um, yeah. But I, you, I, you, you must forgive him. He doesn't always know. Yeah, but I mean, here is somebody who is actually pregnant. Yeah. I mean, are you on leave? Are you going to leave? Is, is your job going to be affected? You don't have to answer that if you don't have to. Stand up and show people your job. certain milestones in your early 30s, you're disqualified for a job anymore, because that actually does work hard. And actually, the sort of women we want to be mothers of the next generation are the ones most hard to about that. But it also <coughs> is about men, and that's why I think that, as, as we've seen in Scandinavia, they also insist that men take their leave as well, because there is nothing. Uh, it, it's a really good thing <coughs> for men to be involved with their young children, to form a relationship with their young children. Boys and girls need to have strong male role models who are actively engaged with them. Young men today want to be more involved in family life. 
And so you shouldn't be just looking at a woman and saying, she may be becoming a mother in shortly. You've also got to look at the young men and say, well, they may be becoming fathers as well. And, uh, and we can organize the way we do maternity leave, parental leave, in such a way as to um, balance these things up better so that men and women can share that. Let's squeeze two, two or three more questions. Great question. Go on. Thank you. Just continuing on the gender equality in the workplace, I was wondering what your thoughts are regarding imposing quotas to have women on the boardroom, and particularly how companies um, champion more the talent of both men and women on the workplace in particular to have the pound, these misconceptions automatically that women are being given a a better job offer just because they are women, because you have to hit that target. Well, I think I've, I've said before that I am in favour of quotas at the moment for women on the boards, but I don't think it's a long-term solution. Uh, for a start, um, so I, I wouldn't say that I was in favour of quotas forever. I'm also in favour, by the way, of quotas in, in Parliament too, because I think it, you have to do something to break the mould, because if we don't, as the um, World Economic Forum report shows, it's going to take another 171 years before women achieve parity with the men. And we really cannot wait that long. It's not acceptable well, in, in for the young women life in this. Everywhere. No, no, that's an economic life. In political life, it's even worse, actually. I think it's 200 years or something. I can't remember exactly that. But let me tell you, it's a long, long time. Everyone in this room will be dead before that happens. <laughs> well, it's making us out. <laughs> But, but, going, but, but the, um, going back to so, so I think quotas are a short-term solution to a, a problem that has developed over over decades and that needs to be addressed. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, going on also about what you were saying about the workplace in general, or today for what we stop, um, you know, it's very interesting now that we have got to stop people saying, "Oh, she only got the job because she's a woman." We've also got to stop. Um, People saying, you know, look at that man, he can't be serious about his job because he's left home early to go to his daughter's school play. You know, because actually, some of the young men, some of the men in the room, I know, will we'll find that. We should stop people thinking, oh, look at that man who's come to pick up his children, he must be a child molester. I mean, really, we have got to stop, stop having these preconceived ideas about how people lead, lead their lives. People should have the choice to leave live their lives in the way that suits them and their families. You don't and they don't have to make them. Yeah, I mean, actually, you women are much more superior than men already. I mean, we have to open a door for you. We can't swear in your presence. On a boat, if it goes down, we have to let you off first, <laughs> unless you're Italian. And uh, <laughs> all these things, we have to respect you. You are actually... We are less equal than you are ready. I don't understand why you're wanting more. There seems to be a lot of support for and talk of Sharia law becoming more becoming more prominent in this country. As a domestic violence advocate, I have strong concerns about that. I just wondered what your thoughts on it were. Well, so, I'm terribly sorry, but I didn't quite catch the first bit. Sharia law. Oh, Sharia law, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, domestic violence. Look. It's a very big question, but you, uh, Sharia has one minute and then we're going to have to call okay. the border across because we've really Domestic violence is unacceptable and we, we can't allow our laws which say that that, that, that that should not take place. It's a serious matter, a serious offence uh, to be got around by uh, other cultural norms. It's not, it's not good enough. There are certain basic levels that we have to insist upon. And so, um, on the other hand, we also have to recognize that if people, uh, as people have done for years, for example, uh, in the Jewish religion, if you are very religious, actually your, your family law and your divorce law can be dealt with within the Jewish community. And people, if they choose to live in a certain way, have a, can to some extent um, make those choices, but what they can't do is break our laws, which is why child marriage is wrong, it's why forced marriage is wrong, it's why um, taking uh, young school girls uh, 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 away out of school to, to, to get them married overseas is equally wrong. It's certainly why domestic violence is wrong and it's why honor killings are wrong. And all of those things are dealt with in our law uh, and that law has to be obeyed because people who live in our country have to obey our laws. Well, I'm afraid um, the hour is up. I have to say that there's a Lady there who looks exactly like Theresa May. Oh. <laughs> you stand up. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I looked at that. I thought Theresa May was here. <laughs> uh, anyway, look, thank you very much for coming. Will you please join me in thanking Theresa May?